Good evening. Um, glad you're with us tonight. Now I'm going to give a few minutes here for hopefully people to come on. I didn't give any warning or send out a, a text. Uh, apologize for that. But it uh, looks like we had one just come on now. Maybe it was me, myself. I don't know. But um, uh, I'm glad you're here uh, on this Wednesday night. This will be our last Wednesday night um, anyways until uh, from home anyways. That's the, the plan. Uh, we'll be uh, coming back uh, into session. I'm going back out. Of, I'm coming out of quarantine tomorrow, and and some others are. And um, every uh, the news is is good for everybody, um, which we're glad about. Um, just kind of want to let you know we we are working on some recommendations with um, uh, coming back Sunday and trying to do things to to keep us safe. And we'll be working on those, and again, they're going to be recommendations. Um, uh, one of the things we, uh, we've we said before, uh, we, we have a congregational form of church government. Uh, by that means that we make decisions. Uh, everybody in the congregation who is a believer and a follower of Christ uh, has a vote and has a say-so, an, an equal say-so within the congregation. And, um, and so um, demanding things of you is not something we do, but at the same time from a leadership standpoint, we, we have to make... Um, those strong recommendations uh, as to, to do things to keep us safe and, and uh, with that. So the deacons and I are working on that, working on the wording of that. And, um, but we're excited about being back together on Sunday. Uh, some things coming up uh, that we're, we're looking at. And um, again, um, um, just, just want to encourage you there to either plan on being there Sunday or uh, planning on tuning in online, one of the two, uh, as we come to a place um, uh, together to, to worship and to, to celebrate our relationship with Jesus and one another uh, together in those settings. So tonight we continue with our Bible study out of the, uh, uh, the book of Isaiah. Um, uh, we're, we're, we're coming through that book as we uh, will finish this up in November. Um, uh, again, uh, We'll, we'll finish this up uh, through November and start a new unit in December, I believe. But uh, Robert will be back, should be back in line. Robert and friends next Wednesday night from the church, and, and again, excited about that. But we're in Isaiah chapter 46 tonight, and um, uh, if you go and you look at this, I, I just began um, looking at this, and uh, um, I, the idea of, of this is uh, the theme of God is great. Uh, my grandkids uh, have a have a song that uh, uh, they sing when I come to see them. They say, "Granddad is great," but then there's a punchline to it. Granddad's great because he brings us chocolate cake. Because I have a habit of going by um, someplace, Brahms or someplace, if I'm going to go see grandkids and picking up some chocolate cake someplace and bringing it to them, and they like to sing that song. Granddad's great, brings us chocolate cake. Woo! And um, they do that, but. Uh, where, where my greatness uh, with my grandkids is limited to chocolate cake, we all know God is great, but we ask the question, why is he great? And, and basically the answer to that is because of who he is and what he's done. God is great because of who he is and what he's done. Uh, we come to this passage of scripture and we see here today, again, we're, we're talking about, we're beginning the second part, again, when you, when you remember when we're talking about that Isaiah uh, the first 39 uh, chapters of Isaiah are dealing with a time frame uh, of, the, of an 8th century B.C. In the 700s uh, 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 B.C., uh, what we find beginning when chapter 40 to the end of the book is a time frame from the 6th century from the 500s. Um, and so, um, again, you have this advance there. There are some materialists, some who... who uh, discount some of the supernatural aspects of the Bible, said there had to be two Isaiahs. Uh, we don't hold that view. We believe in the supernatural inspiration of Scripture and that um, Isaiah was inspired by the Holy Spirit to, to see things um, in, in the 200 years into the future of what's happening. And he's writing there. And I think there'll be some encouraging um, things. But what we find here is, again, this, this is a series of of sayings, of sermons, and, and poetry, and different things that Isaiah is writing to, to encourage these exiles uh, who he's prophesied that they'll be the number one of the nation of Israel will go into exile, 
but then they're going to return. And so he's saying these things to them um, uh, about what's going to happen. And, and, uh, and I just ask you the question, how do, how do God's plans for the future uh, that we find in Scripture encourage you? Are you encouraged by uh, the, the fact that God has seen things into the future and has uh, brought those things to us? And so, uh, again, with that. So let's take a pause for just a second. I'm going to pray for us um, as we begin tonight. And then we're going to begin our Bible study. And I'll begin uh, by, by looking at these scriptures uh, with that. So if you want to turn in your Bibles, grab your Bibles and uh, look at Isaiah chapter 46. And uh, we'll start right after I pray. So pray with me now. Father, we come tonight. We, we thank you for um, uh, this time together as a church, even though we're separated by, into our homes and um, we're separated by an by a invisible virus that's out there, in some cases because of, of weather and different issues and just distance, Father, but, but because of this technology, you draw us together. Father, whether we're in the same room or whether we're scattered and uh, not personally connected in any way, we're still your church. We're still drawn together through the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Father, we ask tonight that you speak to us, Lord. Um, help me to communicate. Help me to communicate clearly and effectively, Lord, your word. Not my words, not what, you, um, not what I want to say, but what you want me to say, Father, in this. Uh, again, help it to be clear and concise. Father, pray for those who are listening tonight. Father, use your word, Father, to, to encourage them, to inspire them, to, um, Father, there's one, one passage in Hebrew says that we, we spur, one another, spur one another on to good works. And Father, in that, that we do that for one another. So again, Lord, thank you. We love you. And, and Father, I pray this tonight in the name of Jesus. Amen. So again, we're going to look at this and we're going to take this kind of verse by verse or, or sections of verses tonight and, and we're going to talk about what do we learn about God from this why is God great why is God great and when you look at uh, chapter or verses 1 and 2 of chapter 46 you see these words again it really say nothing about the God of the Bible but, but it begins with uh, it says Bel bows down and Nebo stoops low their idols that are carried about are that, that are carried about are, are burdensome a burden for the weary, for the weary, they stoop and bow down together, unable to rescue the burden. They themselves go off into captivity. So again, you see this again has nothing in these first two verses with this. But uh, one of the things we learn out of this is that um, uh, by, by default, looking at this is that God is a God of blessing. God is a God of blessing. What do I mean by that? Well, uh, you see these two guys, Bel and Nebo, and Bel was the um, was the, the primary god of the Babylonians. He was the main god. And, and Nebo, interestingly, was his son. And uh, they're tied together. And you, you find that Nebo used in a lot of names. When you think of the name Nebuchadnezzar, that's tied to that name, uh, Nebo, in some way. But, but what you find in these two verses, and, and the, the prophet saying through the Holy Spirit, that, uh, again, the reality that these idols these false gods were a burden to the people what you find about them again that their 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 idols are born by beast of burden uh they had to be carried about by animals in carts and and the fact that that uh these were heavy precious metals they were made they were expensive uh they had to be crafted there were things uh, they couldn't move on their own they couldn't go they were confined to time and space and in the sense that where we're confined to time and space, we can move about and we can make decisions. They couldn't even do that. They, they had to be manipulated and carried about uh, by those who worship them. And so with that, you, you again, you find uh, this, that, that they're, they're that burden that they bear on the people because of the inanimate nature that they are, the, the unreal nature that they are. They're, they're real objects, but they're not objects that are... Um, uh, meant to be God in the sense they're just material things and uh, you go back and read in Romans 1 what we do with that when we take and uh, deny God the God of the universe we, we begin to worship things that are not God and so again looking at that I I think it's interesting Jesus in, um, in Matthew 11 talks about himself and he, and he says that uh, being uh, the son of God he, Jesus says this he says come to me all of you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. 
Take my yoke and learn from it, because I am lowly and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. That's again Matthew eleven twenty eight through thirty, and again finding that 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 issue that that uh, God is not a God that causes burden, but brings one of blessing. When we trust and put our faith in Him, uh, we find uh, again that it relieves our burden because He's that God of grace, God of of the universe who who blesses us um, as much more more than ever we could just be a blessing to Him. So again, uh, with that, we find that God is great because uh, he's a God of blessing. Another thing in the second, in the third and fourth verse is God is great because he's the God of all life. He's the God of all life. Uh, let me read this again, verses three and four. And it says, listen to me, O house of Jacob, all of you who remain uh, of the house of Israel, you whom I have upheld since you were conceived and have carried since your birth, even to your old age and gray hairs, I am he, I am he who will sustain you. I have made you and I will carry you and I will sustain you uh, and, and I will sustain you and I will rescue you. So again, what we find here again, talking about himself in here is that uh, he's the God of life. And specifically, this, this is this, this idea of using a person. It's a, a metaphor, personification of talking about the nation of Israel as a person. And he says, I was there when you were conceived. And, and I think really that goes back probably to Abraham and the calling of Abraham and uh, that, that you go and I'll make you into the person that or into the nation that I've called you to be. If you'll be faithful to me. And Abraham does that. We know that through the patriarchs that eventually they're going to be uh, land in, in Egypt and uh, in Egypt that they're going to be formed into a nation. And Moses is going to rise up and lead them out into the promised land. And so that idea of not only being conceived, but being birthed as a nation. And he said, all the way to, to here, all the way to this point, um, I'm going to be that person. And he uses the adage of, of old age, someone being um, uh, older in years and uh, with the gray hair. And, and um, I saw a post on, on Facebook from some of our members from an old setting and one of our members said they were they were dressed up as an older person and they said my hair's that way for real now I don't have to wear a wig and and uh, in that where a lot of us are finding ourselves uh, that way now but what we know is that uh, when we were children when God was with us when we were conceived God was with us at our birth through our growing up years even into our senior years uh, that God is with us I know that uh, out of this, that God being the God of life, though, where there's, a, there's a change and there's something different here. I know that uh, when I was growing up, I watched uh, my grandmother, my dad's mother, my father take care of his mother. He cared for her in her old age, and uh, uh, that was the right thing to do. He, he, he saw that, that her needs were met as she, she aged. And, um, but sometime later, I, I know after my dad was started experiencing some health problems and those things that he, um, I went and had to stay with him for a while and help him with some things. And I, he was walking me out to my car when I was leaving and he apologized to me saying, I'm so sorry you're having to do this. And I said, well, dad, uh, know that I watched you take care of your mother. Now it's my turn to do this for you. And someday my children are going to do that for me. There's a progression of life, a linear progression of life as we move through this. Not a circle of life, but a progression of life uh, that we find. And again, uh, we, we wind up taking care of our parents. This analogy falls short, though, with God. We never come to a place, whether we're a newborn baby or an old person um, looking at the end of our life. Uh, God is in control. God is the one taking care of, providing for us always. He is the God of life the God of life. And so again, that, that uh, finding that burden, I, I thought of another story with that uh, out of my family. My other grandmother, my, my maternal grandmother, um, she, she was uh, one who, who cared for people um, right up to, to the point, just, just literally days before she died. She was one of their few friends that, that still drove and uh, still was around. And um, uh, I know uh, she would go and 
uh, one of her ministries was to go and get people that, that were in the nursing home, and she would take them to town to buy supplies that they needed, things that they needed, and uh, that was a regular activity that she engaged in. Um, one day, my, my dad's brother, my uncle, was going to the nursing home to visit, and there was a man sitting out front uh, with a suitcase, and my, my uncle knew him and recognized him and uh, said, uh, said, well, uh, greeted him and said, are you going someplace? And the man said, yes, I'm I'm getting married. And he says, oh, you are? To who? Congratulations. And he said, he by name mentioned my grandmother, my mo my mother's mother. And uh, he said, oh, really? And he went in, my uncle went in and called my dad and said, well, congratulations. I hear your mother-in-law is getting married, and, uh, which he in turn called her immediately. And she said, heavens no. She said, uh, if I get married again, I'm not going to marry somebody that I have to take care of. I'm going to get married to somebody who takes has to take care of me, uh, or that will take care of me. And uh, with that idea that she never remarried, she never did, but she 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 was in the hands and care of God, uh, knowing that um, that who that is who cared for her. So again, we 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 find this um, sense that God is great because He's the God of all life. But another thing we find here is God is great because he's an inc incomparable God. Let's look at verses 5 through 7. Read with me, 5 through 7. And it says here, To, um, to whom will you compare me or, or count me equal? To whom will you liken me that we may be compared? Some pour out gold from their bags and weigh out silver on scales. They hire a goldsmith to make it into, into a god. And they bow down and worship it. They lift it on their shoulders and they carry it. And they set it in its place and there it stands. From that spot it cannot move. Though, it, though one cries out to it, it does not answer. It cannot save him from his troubles. So again, what they're saying here, here's this God of the universe who, uh, again, remember the, the very first words of the, of the New Testament or the Old Testament are, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He, he is a God who is spirit. He is at all places, at all times. He is omnipresent. He is all powerful. He's all knowing God uh, that we worship and serve. And, and he says the ridiculousness of serving this man-made object that can do nothing that can do nothing. He said, you can want to compare me to, to that kind of person. Um, Israel, Israel was, was literally, particularly in this time frame, was a monotheistic drop in, in, in a polytheistic ocean. Uh, they were the only monotheists that, that existed, that had, as far as we know, had ever existed. That, and they were that because God called them uh, into that relationship, and, um, and and yet we find that there's no comparison in that drop uh, compared even to the ocean of, of polytheism, that God is great because he's just an incomparable God. I think it's interesting, and if you go into John chapter 6, you find Jesus, uh, again, that, that passage, and I'll skip through, it's a long passage and bizarre in many ways of the things going on, uh, in there, but but Jesus says some really really difficult things, very hard things in uh, John chapter six. As a matter of fact, he says things that are so hard that the vast majority of people following him turn and walk away. They said, "Who can handle this teaching? Who can handle what he's saying?" And they turn and leave him and and follow and 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 walk away. And his disciples, the the twelve, are standing there and. Uh, Jesus turns to them and he says, do you want to leave too? Do you want to go too? And Peter answers that and he says this. He says, Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. So here's this idea that, that they had made the comparison. They had looked at their options and and found that Jesus was the only one. Jesus was the only one that was there that could could meet their need and, and give them what they needed in that eternal life. And and I know that we find in this that, again, from, from Peter's perspective and what was going on, they were talking about the messianic uh, fulfillment here, the, the, the messianic prophecy that Jesus was the promised one. He was the anointed one, the, the, the Messiah who was to come, who we even have references to in these passages you know that that we find that uh, reference to Jesus in there but 
um, again, he met their need. I know I was challenged one time uh, through, a, through a book I read to, to, to say why I was a, a Christian in 20 words or less. And, and the, the answer I came up with, and I've said this before to you, but the answer was, was I desperately need God and I ne- desperately need grace. And Jesus Christ is the only one who not only offers but provides both. He gives me God and gives me grace. And he's the only one. You can look at all the other religions of the world, all the other beliefs, and I think you'd be really surprised that, that when you boil down the basic choices, there's not a whole lot. There's really not a lot of choices. Uh, they, they, they're magnified in a lot of different areas, but when you come to the basics of them, uh, there, there's not that many. The atheistic worldview, the a pantheistic worldview, a monotheistic worldview, and within the monotheism you find uh, different areas, but, but it's the grace of God the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, of what God has done for us that makes God incomparable in any way to any other God that there is. So God is great because he's incomparable. Another thing we find here in verses 8 through 11 is this. God is great because he's the God of history or the God of memories. The God of memories. Listen to this, beginning in verse 8. Remember this. He says, remember this. Isaiah does. Fix it in your in the in fix it in mind, take it to heart, you rebels. Again, now he's chastising him. And again, remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. I make known to the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say my purpose will stand. And I will do all that I please. From the east I summon a bird of prey. From far off, from a far off land, a man to fulfill my purpose. What I have said, that I will bring about. What I have planned, that I will do. What we find here is again that God is great because he's a God of history and of memories. Um, A great way to see the future and tell the future is to see what the pattern patterns God has acted in the past. You can go and look and you see those patterns and I really think what they're calling to do, again looking at these people, the 6th century BC that that Isaiah is writing to, these people that will be um, his, his, the ones who will come after him, uh, the Israelites who will come after him, who will be taken into exile then allowed to return, in way of encouragement he says go back and remember all the things. I think it's interesting that God here says through Isaiah, he says, I am, I say, and I do. And go back and see what I am and what I say and what I do if you want to know the pattern, how I'm going to work. It's important that we do that. We know our history. We know who we are as a people. We know what God has done. We're encouraged by that. We live in troubled times. We live in tumultuous times. And uh, we know that, that um, coming to a place of, of, of seeing how God works and the promises that God has made. And we looked at these promises to the future. And, and sometimes maybe you can get a little uncertain what, what, what's God going to do. But we find that we can go back and see how God has acted in the past and know how he's going to act in the future and trust that. Again, what we find here, and this can be very personal too. Let me tell you, it can be very personal. I know that when um, God called me to ministry, that uh, uh, right after that, I was I was working through things, and, and uh, the youth minister that our church was a, was a man named Keith Lawrence, and he came over for dinner one night at uh, Kathy and I's house, and we were talking, and as we made plans to 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 leave and go to seminary and do the things that we God had called us to do, and and one of the things, and God was working in our lives in a, in a really, really unique way at that time. I, I, I won't go into all the details, but there were things happening that uh, were just a, a really a blessing from God and God moving in our lives and working things out in such a way. And Keith told me, he said, you need to write down what God is doing right now in your life. You need to write it down. He said, because is there going to come a point when you're in seminary or some point in ministry later on when things get tough, when things get difficult, you're going to need to go back and remember what God was doing in your life on these days. And, and I have, and, and I go back and I tell that story often. I tell the story of that time frame, that four years of our life from 
the calling to ministry of seminary. Not the only time God has acted in our life, but there was a special, I think, acting in that. And it's important to go back and remember those personal blessings of God, the, the way he was acting in my life to help me through the difficult times now, that God is there and God is going to act if I trust him. And so again, uh, that God is great because he's a God of history. He's also a God of the future. And he's going to do what he says he's going to do. Matter of fact, this, the last part of this is simply this. God is faithful to the end. Verses 12 and 13. He says, listen to me, you stubborn hearted. You who are, are far, uh, who are far from righteous. I am bringing my righteousness near. It is not far away. And my salvation will not be delayed. I will grant salvation to Zion. My splendor to Israel. Boy, what a promise. What a promise to them that... that uh, help was coming. Help was coming. Yeah, he, he called them out uh, to their to their uh, um, to who they were, the, the, the stubborn-hearted people, uh, and they were. You go back, and, and but we really can't cast too big a finger at them, can we? Uh, the Israelites that we have our own stubborn hearts, we have our own shallow faith, we have our own uh, cluttered lives that we bring to God, and and uh, and he probably can look at us and say the same thing you stubborn hearted and say say that to us again he's talking about here in verse 13 i'm bringing my righteousness near it's not far away and again my salvation will not be delayed and we need to understand that we're not talking about salvation in the immediate well for the israelites i think immediately this is going to be fulfilled in the person of cyrus a name a king named cyrus out of persia who was going to overthrow uh, that Babylonian Empire and who was going to allow them to return to Israel. But we know that that return to Israel was important for one reason. It wasn't just for the Jewish people, it was for Jesus. They had to return because Jesus was going to come out of the line in that place in that time. It wasn't the end of their troubles by any means. Matter of fact, there were a lot more troubles that were going to come, but they needed the place, they needed the time, and so when we talk about not delayed here, what we're talking about is, is again, not, not in, in an immediate sense from a human perspective, but from God's perspective. He's going to act in his time and his way to do things that he's doing. So again, he's faithful to the end. I think what if we're going to do, if we're going to find and have the, the, the blessing that's going to come from God through this is um, you really need to believe God for, for who he says he is. I believe God is who he says he is. And secondly, I believe he's going to do what he says he's going to do. That, that's where faith comes in. That faith and, and again, who God is and what he's going to do. And, and, and not just in this world, but in my life and in your life, in the life of the church. We look at that, and it's important that we understand if we're going to believe in who he is, we have to know who he is. And we have to look at his word and know how God has revealed himself through his word. And we look at his word and find out what God has done and what God is going to do. And then we put our faith and we put our trust and we put our hope in him and what he's done and what he's going to do. And we, in that we find peace, we find encouragement, we find hope, we find joy, we find all those things that we long for in our life. So again, with that, I, I again, uh, just a, a great passage of scripture. Um, thank you for letting me share that with you uh, this evening. I, I hope that uh, you're, you're uh, again, doing well. Uh, I know there's prayer requests out there. Some have gone out today. I know you've seen those. I encourage you to, again, pray for one another, pray for our church, uh, pray for our, our nation. What we have coming up uh, just in uh, a few days, the, the election is going to be held the I know a lot of you have already voted. Most people, a lot of people have, and uh, my plan's coming out of quarantine to go tomorrow. Um, encourage you to vote. Um, I'm not going to tell you to vote, who to vote for, but that you go vote, that you exercise, that we have a privilege and a right uh, here, to, and we need to exercise that uh, and exercise it in such a way that, that um, uh, it brings glory and honor to God. Uh, again, encourage you to, to get out and make sure you do that. I think for years there's been a lot of Christians who, who, who've not taken the responsibility, but we're called to be, again, a, a responsible people and have an opportunity to go into um, uh, the, the, this arena. And we have this privilege and right, and we need to exercise it to the glory of God. 
again, thank you for this evening. Let me pray for us, and, and again, we'll be dismissed tonight. Father, again, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for 2,700 years ago that you spoke through the prophet Isaiah, Father, that so blesses our heart today. Father, just encourage. I pray for Jan Lee Baptist Church, uh, your church, Father, that um, a band of believers that uh, gathers uh, at a particular place and a particular time. And But, Father, we exist beyond that. And, uh, Father, we'll, we'll um, even into eternity, into heaven, that we'll know one another and, and celebrate with one another. Father, I, I just pray for those needs that have been shared today. There's those out there, those some recovering, Father, from injuries. From uh, two, We have two young ladies in our uh, fellowship and our church that are recovering from um, uh, injuries or suffered in car wrecks, Lord, and, and had surgery. And, Father, that uh, you be with them and heal their bodies. We know that there are people dealing with COVID um, that continue to deal with that and are trying to recover. Other illnesses and diseases that are out there, Lord, that are affecting our um, our congregation, Lord. I know the, a lot of people are discouraged, Father, maybe dealing with financial issues and hardships, not uh, knowing where, where their jobs are, maybe relationship struggles, um, uh, Father, in so many ways. But whatever they are, Father, let us trust and turn to you for that help. And, Father, that we lean and encourage one another and help bear one another's burdens, Father, whatever those are. Again, Lord, we, we um, uh, just thank you, Lord. We love you, and we pray this tonight in the name of Jesus. Amen. I know it's time to go because I'll show you my candles are about burning out. We barely had a fireside chat tonight. So, uh, again, I'm glad you're here. Uh, God bless you.